Okay, we'll get started. And we are now in a new book, Vaikra. We just finished up Shemot, which is names or Exodus. And now we're into a, a completely different ethos in terms of what it's like to read the text. Um, it's not a story. It's, it's not, uh, it is moral law, but less so than say other Torah portions like Mishpatim maybe or Kitisa. Um, the laws tend to be very particular to the priesthood or the Levites or Israel's relationship to that priesthood or their relationship to those Levites. I know years ago, um, I think back in the early 2000s at some point, uh, I did a teaching series called Holy Spaces that was based on the book of Vayikra because the Vayikra teaches you the, the 10 holy spaces of Israel. Now don't ask me to name them off the top of my head right now. It's been a while since I've done that study. But the idea, especially in the book of Baikra or Leviticus, is that it defines spaces for certain things to happen and for certain things not to happen. Um, and you do the same thing. Uh, you have your workspaces and you might have restricted spaces in your workspace. There might be restricted spaces where only certain people can go certain types of workers, certain types of workers who only have a specific type of equipment. We all make set aside spaces for the things that we need to do in life. And it's the same thing at home with your family. There are people probably who come into your home that are perfectly welcome there, but there's people that you definitely want to knock on the door before they come in. They don't have the key to your house because that's a holier space than your front porch or the street or Walmart or wherever. So you've got degrees of holiness even within your own home. You're the priest of your house and you decide who comes into those holier spaces. You know, and even within your house, there are holier spaces. There's places that are off limits to certain members of the family for a good reason, right? Um, if let's say you have a basement without a railing on the steps, do you allow the children down there when they're toddlers? No, because they might fall off of the steps. And, and so it's a protective reasoning. That's the reason typically that we have holy spaces. It's not, usually for the purpose of elitism or exclusivism, exclusivism, there's more syllables in that. Um, most of the time, it's simply because we want to protect people or protect ourselves, all right? We know the, the border thing has been blowing up in the news for the last, what, three years? Because people have different ideas about how to protect the holy spaces or they have no desire to protect anything at all, no boundaries. Um, but I think, you know, especially with the situation we're in right now with a, with a pandemic, um, a virus that can be spread apparently very easily, um, it's, I don't think they know exactly, you know, what it takes to spread the thing at this point. Um, you know, they say a mask won't help, but then everybody I see saying that's wearing a mask. So, <laughs> Who knows? Uh, <laughs> it may, maybe it means it, it won't help me get a mask if you're wearing a mask. I don't know what that means. Not to make light of it, but it's definitely brought into our awareness the need for boundaries and how much boundary is necessary, but how much boundary just completely destroys everything. And that's the tightrope that we see in Vaikra. There is a call to holiness for the nation that is supposed to keep them separate and holy from other nations, but yet not to exclude them. 
because over and over when we think we're onto something here and we're all into this holiness stuff and yeah, I'm going to be holy and I'm going to come out from the world. And they says, well, but wait a minute. I, I don't want you to oppress the stranger and alien because you were a stranger in Egypt. Or, you know, um, it, it talks about inclusive, inclusivism. I kind of find a different word with fewer syllables. Inclusivism. Exclusivity. Yes. Um, in terms of there's one law for the stranger and alien and for the native born. And you say, well, are we separate from them or, or are they part of us? And of course the answer is exactly. And we're gonna look at this yes. Um, I know you're used to me doing it just for fun uh, to stretch your mind a little bit, but I'm gonna show you how important it is to be able to say that because many people who are studying Torah, they cannot yet bring themselves to say yes. They're still in an either or and that's, they're not really in a position to hear that that's still infantile in terms of their thinking. It's still nursing children sort of thing. Uh, they're basically one note, one speed, but that's where you start out. You have to start sorting through things. So we've got compassion for someone in that position, but our compassion tends to wear thin when they become militantly ignorant. Um, there's ignorance and then there's militant ignorance. And that's where respect for age and experience should factor in, but it's not really a hallmark of the United States, at least since the 60s. So uh, don't count on people who don't understand what you're doing, just simply respecting your age or your wisdom. Uh, it would be nice if they did. But boundaries are important because I don't think we really understand the power of the Mishkan. We get glimpses of it and we just read through it every year like, oh yeah, there was a lot of glory in the cloud and you know, the stuff was powerful and you know, maybe people fell down when the glory fell. We're saying all that in hymns, right? But think about the power, because remember the Mishkan was the people and it's, it's comprised of people who were all fit together. Remember, they were the textiles that were brought in and they, they had to fit together. And so when you bring that many souls into a particular activity and they're all on the same page, they're all headed in the same direction, there is an incredible power just of the nefesh, just of the soul itself. That's not even factoring in the spiritual realm, which we're also talking about how the, the indwelling presence is going to descend down and, and fill those spaces that they've opened up for him. Just think of the incredible power of the soul. I don't know how many of you have ever, I've never been to a Super Bowl, but if you've ever been to a professional sports game, if you've ever been to a NCAA, like a basketball tournament, and you sat on the home side, okay? You weren't the one and, you know, one of the five people from the opposing team. You were in the crowd and maybe there were 10, 20, 30,000 people all headed in the same direction as far as what they wanted to happen and what they expected to see, what they expected to get out of that shared experience. And so, you know, just even being in the Arkansas Razorback gym, right? Whether you're singing the school fight song, whether you're singing the school song itself, it didn't matter whether it was truly holy or not. It didn't matter whether it had any spiritual component, and it didn't, by the way, <laughs> there was no spiritual component. We had school spirit, right? It was school soul, let's, let's just admit what it was. When we all called the hawks at the same time, it was electrifying. You could feel it in the gym or you could feel it in the stadium. You could feel the bleachers shake because everybody's calling the hawks at the same time. Okay, so just insert your team or your activity. When you get that many people cheering for the same thing to happen, right? <laughs> uh, okay, look, I don't eat pork, but I do support it, all right? Go Hawks. Uh, there is an incredible power of the collective soul. 
So when we're looking at the Mishkan, we can see there's this collection of souls who are now enthusiastic. They're, they realize they've made a mistake here with the golden calf. And so their total intention, their total concentration for the number of months it takes to build the Mishkan, it's totally focused in one spot. And then it's erected and the presence is there and great things are happening. And so getting caught up in this soul ecstasy, basically, well, Nadav and Avihu got caught up in the moment and got killed. Right? So there was an incredible power in this Mishkan. And the power was so great, you could make this one mistake. You could grab your fire pan and put some incense and coals in there. And basically get burned up. Bam. That fast. I mean, that fast. I mean, talk about lightning from heaven, right? That fast. So we know when we're talking about the Mishkan, we tend to deconstruct it to try to figure out the curtains and the gold rings and the boards and the sockets. And, and we need to do that. But we don't need to forget the incredible power, both of the collective soul of Israel, plus the spiritual power of the presence of Adonai that met them there. So, so there's two incredible powers there, the human participation and the, basically the fusing of their spirit with his in a meeting place. And so um, one rabbi, as I was reading through the commentaries this morning, he said it was something like nuclear power. You know, when you put those many forces together in one spot, it can be an incredible amount of force. And so knowing that you're trying to conduct daily activities in this location where there's this much power, it's, it's really important and vital that boundaries be set. Because right after Nadav and Avihu die, then we get boundaries. Okay, number one, uh, look, don't drink before you go in to do your service, right? It's, it's going to affect how you conduct your service. So there's a rule right off the bat that said, okay, this could factor in something. You cannot be that casual when you go in here. We get the idea that they had stepped in and taken their father's service. He had not had a chance to conduct the, the incense ceremony yet. And so basically it was a usurpation that got caught up in the ecstasy and they stepped in front of dad. Uh, you can't do that. There has to be boundaries and those, those boundaries are not to prevent you from experiencing the best that you can experience in the Holy presence. The boundaries are there to protect you from the Holy presence. Remember, Moses says, I want to see you. And he says, well, let me put you in a hole in a rock and cover you up. <laughs> and he says, then maybe, you know, I can let my, my goodness pass before you. But you have to understand the incredible power. And in our fallen state, we're not quite prepared to meet that power and to, to physically live. The spirit is is a different story, but physically we're just not designed to live in that, I don't want to call it an energy field because it sounds like something out of science fiction, but maybe why not, okay? Um, because there was an incredible amount of spiritual energy there. So in Vayikra, it tries to straighten out for us, to help us in our minds say, let me, as an Israelite, let me always examine where I am in relation to where the boundary is for my current condition, because we all go through different states of purity and impurity just on a normal human cycle. It doesn't mean you sinned. It just means that this holy space that actually you opened 
by the way. Remember, if you're the Mishkan, if you were part of that, then what you brought in was that opening of your heart for the presence to come in. But that presence is holy. And so there's an intimacy that takes place there. And so knowing that you've made this holy space for the presence to come in and, and to dwell with you, you just have to understand that there's times where you have to observe in the physical realm certain boundaries. And it has to do with tahor and tameh, which you know tahor is usually translated uh, clean, and then tameh is usually translated unclean. It doesn't mean, mean that you, you're without sin or that you're sinful. That's not what it means. It means that you agree to observe these boundaries. And by agreeing to observe these boundaries, you were actually going through the process of opening up a greater realm of holiness. You say, okay, now I can be in a, a state of ritual impurity. Let's say I, I have a, a discharge. And so I know I can't go in the temple, so I refrain myself from going in the temple. How is that a holy thing? the very act of your obedience, you've opened up more space. Ironically, by not going in, then had you gone in in impurity. So again, it, it's, it's difficult because, you know, we do have normal human things that happen to us that are for a season or for a time, they're going to preclude us from going inside certain spaces. Don't equate it with sin, right? What you're getting is another opportunity for obedience. You're actually in that state of tame. You're being given an opportunity to acquire a greater level of holiness. So there's irony in that. People just tend to skip through this because it's not interesting. It makes you feel left out. It makes you feel like you're not worthy. It makes you feel dirty. Well, remember, these are feelings. And who cares how you feel? We care what's written. Because your feelings will lie to you. They're seasonal. They're situational. Um, but what is written is steadfast. And you were loved. And you were loved so much that the father has put locks on certain cabinets. He's locked certain doors at certain times. He'll put up, you know, a security fence in some places. Uh, that's a good thing because as a parent, you do exactly the same thing. And it doesn't have anything to do with whether the child has sinned or not. It has to do with the child's ability to stay healthy in that place where you're not ready yet for that child to be in or something needs to change. He needs to grow a little bit. He needs a, a greater skill in some area. And at some point he can go down in that basement because you don't have to worry about him falling off the steps or it's okay to play in the backyard if there's no fence uh, because you know he won't run into the traffic. And it's, it's kind of like that with the presence and the power, the divine power, it is so powerful that he puts these fences in place so we won't run in someplace like Nadav and Avihu um, because we do have free will. And we're gonna talk a lot about free will tonight and tomorrow. And what is the greatest sacrifice you can bring? So let me start sharing. There it is. And by the way, um, I looked back at my notes from this Torah portion from last year, and they were really good. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, they were really good in relation to what I want to share tonight. And so I know there's no way I can transfer you a huge video file, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, I do still have the audio file. And if you want to listen to it again, just email me 
and it should up, I can send it, um, I think on that Google Drive thingamajigger, um, where it'll upload there and then you can get in there and you can download it again. If, if you don't have Viacrop from 2019, because they're, they're really like twin lessons is what I noticed because it, it has to do with um, what the particular structure of Vaikra meant. Because if, you, if you've looked at a Hebrew text, you realize that there's a letter in Vaikra that is tiny, tiny, tiny rel relative to the other letters of Vaikra. But Vaikra means and called. Kra. Um, so if it can also mean what happened. That's why I thought you might want to go back and listen to last year's. If you remember, like, one of the uses was, and he happened upon Bilam when he decided to go ahead and, and function as a, you know, cursor in charge of Israel. And then he's going to be happened upon. So we know there's a context like last week where it's not all, you know, uh, cotton candy. When he happens upon you, it can be for destruction. So when we say kara in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, if we want to say um, what's up or what's happening, we say makara, makara, what's happening, right? What's happened upon you? What's going on? And so we're getting the translation and called, but it has this more sinister side that, that I say, you might want to go back and take a look at that again. So you can see the contrast between the love of the one call and then the more sinister aspect of, of being happened upon and the other type of call. But that's what it means and called. And remember, we, we're going to keep practicing our index cards, our Torah uh, portion index cards. And, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to do it in every single portion because sometimes I forget about it till I'm about done with what I'm doing. But um, with our tour portion by Kra, instead of just focusing, fo focusing only on the tour portion, I made it kind of as by Kra would apply to the entire book. Of by Kra, not just the tour portion by Kra. So from start. Here we go. Here's our little contrast. And remember my, my dilemma is I'm reading in the New Testament and I want context for what I'm reading in the Torah. So I go back through my index cards and I try to find a similar word or theme. Maybe it's a phrase. So let's say I'm reading first Peter. Well, what I'll notice in 1 Peter is that there's a repetition um, of being called. And I've put some sample verses on there for you. I put 1 Peter 1.15, I put 1 Peter 2.21, I put 1 Peter 3.9, I put 1 Peter 5.10. And you're seeing here again this repetition of the word called. And I, I'll, I'll show you the slide here in a minute that shows you that the Greek that Peter is using, the cognate of it is kara from our Torah portion. So once I did that, let's say I'm reading, I say, well, there's kind of a repetition in this text of being called. Where do I have a context for that? So I go back to my index cards and I say, oh, Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. It's the first portion of the book of Leviticus. So let me match what I'm reading in First Peter and his Vayikra with what I have in my notes about the book or the Torah portion, Vayikra. And so we can see some matches here that they're going to lead us to maybe conclude that first Peter may have been using this as a text. I think that pretty frequently when the apostles are writing epistles, 
what might, because they tend to be thematic. I think what might be going on is the same thing that happens to us. When Passover is on our mind, everything is about Passover. When Shavuot's on our mind, everything's about Shavuot. When Sukkot's on our mind, everything's about Sukkot. So what's in our consciousness, we tend to point that out and, or be aware of it. Um, you know how sometimes you'll, you'll become aware of something. You say, no, I've driven by that place a hundred times and I've never seen that. Well, there was something that brought that thing into your consciousness. And so it's the same thing here. You can drive by a word a hundred times, but once that word comes into your consciousness, you're going to notice when you drive by it. So when you memorize the, not just the names of the Torah portions, but what they actually mean, what that would translate into in English, because when you get into the Brit Hadashah, you're going to be reading that in English, typically. And, and you want to be able to know this word is frequently translated as this word. So we hear 1 Peter um, 1.15, he says, but like the Holy One who called, and there's our cognate word right there, called, who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. And by the way, I, I didn't read a passage first, but the first sentence of Vaikra is, he called to Moses and Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying. So he actually gets three different words that mean to speak in the first sentence. He called, he spoke, and he said. All right, so we get a, a statement from Peter. He says, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Well, if I'm looking at the book of Vayikra, I can look through it and there, you know, it says specifically, be holy for I am holy. But there's variations on that statement. Or he, you might say, for I am the one who sanctifies you. You should be holy for I am the one who sanctifies you. Or I am the God who sanctifies you. There is some form of this, be holy for I am holy. There's some form of this statement that's going to appear 10 times in the book of Vaikra. And so the rationale, we say, well, why do I need to do all these holy things? He just says, because I am. That's why. Basically, because I'm your daddy, I am holy, and if you're my child, I want you to be like me. It's, it's just a real simple statement. You say, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty consistent. Are there any other examples? Well, in 1 Peter 2.21, he says, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. All right, so that's almost like a be holy for I am holy, but it's more of like you need to suffer because Mashiach suffered so that you would follow in his steps, that he was the example of suffering and he wants you to be like that and suffer. Uh, you know, that's probably not the verse to open a conversation with uh, for somebody that you're, you're trying to lead to Yeshua. You can bring it up later. But if we keep reading in context, he says, he gives the rationale. He says, you've been called for this purpose since Mashiach also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He goes on and he says, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, right? So we've got extensive laws in Vayikra concerning the laws of sin and death. And it says in Leviticus 4.35, thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regard to his sin, which he has committed, and he will be forgiven. 
But I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we're talking about these sacrifices, because I know in years past, we've broken down the different types of sacrifices and what they meant and how it all related to resurrection. But I don't know that we've ever really covered what the, the animal didn't cover. All right, and, and you already know this because you, you've read the New Testament, but we're gonna go over that again, just so we're really firm in it. And just so you're really firm in, in the statements that it says in the book of Hebrews concerning the sacrifices for sin, because I want you to be really firm when you have conversations with people um, who speak disparagingly of the sacrificial system because typically they're making those statements not understanding from the beginning what they were all about. So, okay, now we see Peter, he's still talking about a calling, and now he's talking about dying to sin and living to righteousness. The priesthood is responsible for this transaction, um, either in the Mishkan or later in the Mikdash. It's part of the, the calling, the priest's calling. So there's a call, there's a calling. They're going to be very similar in what we're looking at. Uh, the calling, we might call it a vocation. First uh, Peter 3, 9, he says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing, right? So why were you called? Just like we have to keep reading in 221 afterward to see, well, why am I supposed to suffer? Um, he says, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. In your suffering, that is part of the dying to sin and living to righteousness, Right? So whereas the priest is assisting you in this transaction in Vayikra, First Peter tells us that, that you need to take control of this process of dying to sin and living to righteousness. And then he goes on in chapter three, he says, don't return evil for evil, give a blessing instead. And he says, by doing this, you will inherit a blessing. That's the point of it. Why do I not, you know, if somebody flips me off, why do I not flip them off back? Uh, if somebody calls me a bad name, why do I not call them a bad name back? He says it's simple, so that you can inherit a blessing. You know, it's the emotion of the moment is short-sighted. But if you can exercise a self-boundary in such a case, then you are going to inherit a blessing. Now, I'm not saying you won't sit there and want to say something back. If you're a human being, you most likely will until you do reach a certain stage of spiritual maturity. And then you just might be kind of sad um, because you realize at some point the, the person does not realize that they have become a Satan. Remember, Satan is someone who accuses before the throne. Words, our words, go before the throne for judgment. And so by throwing these evil words up and making these accusations and so forth, he's basically giving testimony to his own guilt before the throne until such a time as either Satan is thrown down or the person passes away and then has to await the judgment. So he says, for you, don't do that because those words are gonna go right up to the throne. But if you will refrain, you'll inherit a blessing for something you didn't do, which is a pretty good trade-off. Um, and so in Vayikra 1918, it says the same thing. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Right? So taking vengeance on people, it, it almost has to function on the premise that I've never done anything wrong. Um, 
you know, there's traffic is a great place, you know, to learn these lessons. Because yes, a lot of people, they pull out in front of us, they do things that are dangerous. But you know what, if you're a human being, eventually you're going to make some mistakes too. And you're not going to mean to, you're not on purpose trying to make somebody mad or on purpose do something dangerous. But maybe you pulled over and, and there was a blind side right there. There was a blind place in your mirror and you didn't see that car there. Uh, if we live long enough, then we'll realize why we shouldn't take vengeance uh, because it may be us in the same situation the next time. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. If you know you make mistakes, then try to cut people some slack. So the message, that's part of the calling. You were called. So these things are opportunities to inherit a blessing. 1 Peter 5.10 says, after you have suffered for a little while, uh, which I don't want to suffer for a little while, but he says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I say, so could we say the opposite is true? If you refuse to suffer, in other words, if basically you refuse the call, this particular call to holiness, and holiness is actually acquired through suffering, then how perfected, confirmed, strengthened and established do you expect to be for eternity I mean, that's that's one of those thought questions where like you know you do let the crickets chirp for a while but leviticus 22 21 says when a man offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the lord to fulfill a special vow or for a free will offering of the herd or of the flock it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. So what a free will offering or a special vow, when you would bring that in as a sacrifice, you had to bring the most perfect thing in order for the priest to accept it. Remember, the, the priest is officiating this transaction. If you brought in a blind lamb, he's going to turn you away and say, no, you don't understand what this is symbolizing and who this is symbolizing. I'm gonna turn you back and, and come back, you know, when, when you found a more perfect specimen because it represents you, right? But, it's going to represent something else that we're going to get to. But it's Peter's using the same thing. He says that we are that which needs to be perfected, confirmed, strengthened, established. So there's a symbolism between the two. So you say, okay, I understand what First Peter, the letter of First Peter is all about. He's basically reiterating to me the book of Vayikra, and what the meaning of holiness is, but he's giving me much more practical applications than just what I'm getting in the book of Vaikra. Because here I see procedures for a sacrifice in regard to sin, but Peter's telling me more that this is actually in my life. I'm going to be able to identify this process, even without a Mishkan, even without a Mikdash. I'm going to be able to identify this process or this transaction by knowing that I have suffered in a particular way simply because I was called. You say, wow, there's an application of the altar right there. There doesn't have to be a literal temple for me to be able to affect this transaction. I know that when I am suffering for the sake of righteousness and when I am dying to sin, this transaction has taken place in my life. It's as if I had 
gone into the Mishkan. The same thing, if somebody cusses me out, um, then if I stay silent, then I know I'm going to inherit a blessing. And I know that I have actually been part of this transaction that Leviticus 19.18 is talking about not taking vengeance, but loving your neighbor as yourself, understanding that I could be in the same spot next time and so forth. So that's, that's good because I get more specific life applications out of First Peter. Um, Baikra gives me the premise, but in First Peter, I can match it to the things that I'm going through today, what's happening to me right now. So we're going to look at the role of the priest in Baikra, because that's the role that's emphasized in Baikra. Prophecy is not emphasized. It's, it might be mentioned. Um, being a king that's not going to really play a role in Vayikra. Vayikra is the heart of the Torah. And ironically, it's about the priesthood. And in our modern day and time, um, it's, it's really an unfamiliar role to us because what we would call a priest today is probably 99% different from the role of the priest in the Torah. But remember, you say, okay, man, all these ritual rules and everything, what's, what's the goal of this? Well, again, it's about holy things. And it's going to always, remember, point you back to the Garden of Eden. If the whole point of Yeshua, the resurrection, the Torah, etc., is to get you back into the garden and functioning as you were created to function in the garden for all eternity, then we have to look at the book of Vaikra, and it's heavily emphasizing the role of the priesthood, that there is a principle of priesthood that I will need to understand at the resurrection, or should I die first? If I go back into the garden, I need to know these things and call in actually uh, the book itself is called the Torah Kohanim, uh, the laws of the priests, um, the law of the priesthood. So you need to know the laws of the priesthood. If it was just for the priest, then it wouldn't be in a book that everybody was supposed to read. If it was a secret manual, it would still be a secret. Well, probably not with, you know, Kindle and Amazon and all that, but other religions have their secret codes of their priesthoods. They have their secret organizations and, and levels of advancement and so forth. But in Israel, the information is there for everybody to learn, not just to know, but to learn, even though they may never fulfill that particular role. So, okay, so if the essence of it is love your neighbor as yourself, then aren't there too many things attached to that? I mean, we have to write an entire book just to really get down to the negative Vayikra, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there's things in these rituals that again are going to be vital components of your regaining a priesthood in the garden. And we'll look at, at the roles in the garden. What roles were they fulfilling in the garden? And therefore, why do we need to prepare it so that we can go back and fulfill those roles? So yes, it is full of priestly law, but it's also at the heart of it is love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so again, Jonathan Sachs, he always has quotable quotes. And I say, if you, if you do Facebook quotes or blogs or whatever, and you like to have an inspirational quote of the day, he's a great source because he wrote, Vaikra 
is about why love needs law and law needs love. In other words, one is incomplete without the other. And remember the boundaries, the, the holy spaces of the camp, of the Mishkan, were there because of love so that nobody would die. So let's look at the structure. Um, by a crowd, because we have five books of the Torah, we have a, a type of a uh, chiasm. And Vayikra is going to be the axis of that chiasm. And I have them set up here. Um, of course, Vayikra is about building the priesthood. But remember, um, was it week before last, we talked about the parallels between the creation, Genesis 1, and then the steps of building the Mishkan. So there was a creation, and then there was a, a repair of, of going back into that creation and using, uh, in some cases, identical phrasing. Um, and by the way, whenever you see um, separate in Hebrew, lahabdil, in fact, uh, if you do the habdala ceremony on uh, Saturday evening, once the Shabbat has gone out, if you do the Havdalah, you're, you're doing something very similar. You're creating a separation between what is holy and what is secular. You're making a separation or division. That's really a, a priesthood word. So when you see um, the Havdil or some form of that separation, because if you go through Genesis 1, remember it's all about separation, separation, separation. But ultimately, we know separation is in order to gather to like kind and like mind. So being holy is not just being set apart. If you're just set apart, you're dead. By definition, separateness only is death. But if he sets you apart from this one thing in order to gather you to something else, that is true holiness. Marriage is usually the example of holiness. The bride is set apart from all others in order to be joined to her husband, who is of like kind and like mind. So that's true holiness. There is a, an initial separation of something, separating it from something else, but then to gather it in. Uh, even if you look at the two cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant, there's two of them. It's the most separate holy place of any place on earth. Nevertheless, there's a gathering. There's, there's two in there at the very same time. So Vayikra is going to teach us about building and then rebuilding aspects of the garden priesthood. So we look at the, the chiasm itself. So we're going to have Bereshit in a beginning. And that's going to tell us about a garden priesthood of separations. They have certain things that they're supposed to do. There's certain boundaries that cannot be crossed where we've got repeated, like the seed bring, the trees bringing forth seed after their kind, right? There had to be a separation there. Um, the trees can't bring forth seed according to a mixed kind. Trees are not confused, all right? And that's, that's going to be a vital thing to understand about kosher law. See, we're going to encounter the dietary laws in Vaikra. And if you work through the list of animals that are not to be eaten, they cross some sort of boundary. Like, let's say a fish. Most fish are going to have fins and scales. Some don't. Those who don't, they kind of make you wonder. Like, let's say a whale, right? Um, if it's a, I think, I've never been, I mean, I've been close to a whale, but it was so, like, spectacular. I wasn't really, like, getting down to the nitty-gritty with the skin on the whale. I was looking at the barnacles on the whale. 
But let's say a whale, it doesn't have normal fish skin. It doesn't have the scales, it has fins. But we know that a whale is a mammal. So typically you're going to see mammals on land. So there's something about a whale that kind of crosses a boundary. It doesn't mean it's bad, it's the way it was created. But in terms of setting a clear boundary, a non-kosher animal will violate that in some way. Um, I'm trying to think of another one, like a pig, all right? It might have cloven hooves, but it's not gonna chew the cut, right? It's not gonna have the extra stomachs unless you slice the thing open to look. Um, and we don't treat razorbacks that way, do we? So it's, it's kind of fogging the issue there. You need clear cut boundaries. And, and typically, like say a kosher land animal is going to be an animal that eats plants. They're going to eat the things, the original foods of creation that mankind was expected to eat in the garden. We don't have any record of mankind, you know, eating animals in the garden. So what is it doing? The dietary laws, the holies, this particular diet for a holy people, is for people who plan to go back into the garden and regain that state of the beginning, that original garden priesthood, which was definitely a priesthood of separations. You had to know the boundaries of the garden. You had to know where the rivers were. Um, that was part of your service. And making sure that those boundaries were not transgressed. Right, so um, not spotting the serpent as a transgressor, as an initiator of something unholy into a holy place, um, that's not being a good priest. If you allow those transgressions to occur, if you don't maintain the boundaries. After Bereshit, which teaches us about a garden priesthood of separations, then we move on to the book of Shemot which means names. And it's in the book of Shemot, Exodus 19, 6, that Israel is told they are a nation of priests and a holy nation. A whole nation of priests, a holy nation. And so we, we've got, okay, paradise, paradise lost in Bereshit. In Shemot, there's a promise of Paradise can be regained. You can regain that priesthood and that identity as a holy nation. Okay, how do we do that? Next comes the book of Vaikra and called, called the Torah Kohanim, um, the laws of the priests. And because we are a holy nation, the whole nation needs to know the holies of Vaikra, whether or not they are genetically qualified to hold that particular office um, or do that particular function. It's still important for you to know what's in there because the boundaries are important. Okay, so that's where we've progressed to at this time. Paradise, paradise lost. A regaining of an identity as a nation of priests and a holy nation, why? Because they've been separated out from a realm of death called Egypt. And now that they're separated out of that realm of death called Egypt, they have been gathered to like kind and like mind. So now he says, you're a nation of priests, you're holy. And then the next step is I'm going to create a priesthood within a nation of priests. And so again, what the, the Levitical priesthood is to Israel, Israel is to the nations. Right? There's, there's more than one type of priesthood. There's a, a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. So there's mentions that, are, that have prepared us to arrive at this place and called. So there is a calling here. And so, again, going back to what Rabbi Sachs said about this Torah portion, 
he says, if we look at the book of Vaikra, you know, and I'm trying to give you more of an overview of the whole book rather than just this specific tour portion. He says, first, we have the coming close to God via the sacrifices in the holy sanctuary. Next, it discusses the boundary between the holy and the world. And then there's a chiasm here that kind of, how do you take that holy into the world? Right? So if we look at A and A on the slide, the first one coming close to God by the sacrifices in the holy sanctuary, and then its counterpart taking that holy into the world. Both of those are dependent on B, the one in between them. And again, this is why the whole nation needs to know because it's going to be their job to take that holy into the world. So B is the boundary between the holy and the world. So for the priesthood, priesthood, it's especially important to know how to get close to God by the sacrifices in the holy sanctuary. It particularly pertains to them. But then it pertains to the Israelite too, because if he doesn't know those boundaries, then he could come into one unwittingly in a state of impurity or with a defective animal. And so the, the Israelite needs to know these purities because he's going to have a job that's equally important as the Levitical priest. The average Israelite is going to now have to take that holiness into the world. The only way he's going to be able to do that without harm to his own holiness. Now, remember, we, we talked about how Babylon represents coming out of uncleanness. Coming out of Egypt represents coming out of death. But coming out of Babylon represents coming out of an unholy world and not mixing yourself with the world. And so if the average Israelite does not have the book of Vayikra, He's going to be out in Babylon. He's going to be out in the world without any sense of boundary between himself and the world. What does the Torah do? It gives you very specific instructions on how to maintain that boundary between yourself and the world while you're actually in the world. But see, you have to know where it is. If you're out in the world, you need to already know that getting a tattoo like everybody else is off limits to you. You say, well, why can't I do that? It doesn't hurt anything. That's not the point. We're going to get to what the point is. But part of the point is you need to already know what your boundaries are when you go out into the world. Because it's your job to take the holy into the world without letting the unholiness seep into you. And so both positions, whether you're talking about the Levitical priesthood, which they have the very specific, um, very detailed laws of the sacrifices in the holy sanctuary, that's important for you to know. But in terms of your role, your role as a priest may have more with establishing boundaries in the world not in the Holy of Holies. And so you can't toss out of these three parts of Vayikra, there's not one that you can toss away. All three are important, but they both really do depend, like he said, upon B. There has to be a boundary maintained between what is holy and the world. And this is what it says in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. He doesn't say a Levitical priesthood. He says you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
So we can see first Peter really is on topic. He reminds us we have been called. And in context, he makes us think of the holies of Vaikra. He makes us think even of the promise of holiness in Shemot, when he says you're going to be a kingdom of priests, uh, uh, treasured possession. And, you know, the chosen race, again, it goes back to the seed of Abraham that we get out of Bereshit, where we talk about paradise lost, but then this is how paradise regained begins. It begins with a family. It begins with the Abrahamic family, whether you're in the Abrahamic family by lineage or whether you are in it by choice, by calling. Remember, the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he's even at this point bringing into the, the context the, the function of Bereshit, which is the, the garden priesthood. Because if we go back to the garden, if we go back to the creation, remember the steps of creation involved various degrees of separating light and darkness on the first day and on the fourth day. And so he says he has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so we can see here, oh, okay, now I know where I fit into this. Even if I'm not a Levitical priest, then I go back here and I say, hmm, the three functions of Vaikra, coming close to God by the sacrifices in the holy sanctuary. Well, I don't really, can't do that right now. Even if I if there was a temple, I'm not a Levite. I'm not a Cohen, so I can't do that. So I can read it for understanding, but I will never function in that role. And he says, Peter says, no, don't worry about that. He says, go back to the type of priesthood that you were called to, because all three of these are called in the book of Vaikra, the Levitical priesthood, but then for a nation of priests, knowing that boundary between the holy and the world, and then once you know that boundary and you know how to maintain that boundary, then you take the holy into the world and you've got then the expertise to be able to teach that which is holy and to call as many as who might be that chosen race from Abraham uh, out of the unholy world and start bringing them back into the boundaries of the holy. So we don't have to say, oh, I'm not a Levite. You don't need to be a Levite to be a priest. So Peter is going to mention that this Bereshit priesthood is built on the separation of darkness and light. Right? And remember, the Torah is a light. The commandment is a lamp. And so if you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, then your calling, your vaikra, your vocation, is to continually come out of darkness and into the Torah, the marvelous light, the Torah, his marvelous word, the commandments of his word. And this is how you begin functioning in the role of a kingdom of priests. And so Peter is going to keep using this word repetitively in his letter, Ka from Vaikra, uh, the calling. Because if you know that Vaikra is about your calling and the things that you need to know about holiness, then he knows that you're going to call to mind the sacrifices of Vaikra. And then you know, he knows that you're going to be able to put it in the context of Yeshua's sacrifice on the tree. So if First Peter is nothing else, it is a treatise on the book of Vaikra. And, you know, one way you can tell when a, an epistle is doing this when it's basically teaching a Torah portion, is look at the, the caps. If, if you've got a typical Bible, if it's a quotation, 
from the Tanakh, then you'll see it in all caps. And this is out of the NASB. So you can see how much of that verse is actually verbatim out of the Tanakh. Even if I didn't spot called right off the bat, I get where his context is, that he's talking about a priesthood that was established in the Tanakh. And how do I, how can I verify that this is what's going on, that Peter wants me to learn about the priesthood uh, and that it is relevant to me today? Not as a Levitical priest, but as the other kind of priest, as the the priest in training for the garden. We look at the word that he's using there, which in the Greek, it's Strong's number 2564, him who has called you. And we go into the Strong's and it will give us the Hebrew cognate of 2564. And you can see there what it is. It's kala. It's the same root as vaikra. That's your calling. Your calling is to come out of disobedience and come into the marvelous light of the Torah. Why? Because the tree of life was in the center of the garden. And if you were doing your job, guarding those boundaries around the tree of life, doing that service around the tree of life, um, then you might have noticed a shady character, that something of the darkness tried to invade the marvelous light in the center of the garden. And, which I know we ran out of time. Um, but First Timothy 1, 9, and, and this goes back to the exercise you did week before last, where I wanted you to break down the parables into the the principles of either equality in the kingdom or invested in the kingdom and what you found was there was overlap and yeah there is overlap but there is a progression that seems to be taught first timothy 1 9 says that um, there is a salvation and there is a calling and he says uh, who has saved us and called us. There's our word again, the G2564 from Quran, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Right? So these works that we're doing they were actually established from eternity past. Obviously, they'll go into eternity future. So when you were saved, then you are called. And that calling is a calling to holiness. And the point of learning holiness or the point of functioning in that vocation of holiness as a, a priest in training for the garden, he says, it's so that you will gain the glory. It's, it's going to be garments of glory. When, anytime it describes the garments of Aaron and the, the priesthood, it, you know, it says garments for glory and for honor. So when you learn the boundaries of Vaikra, whether you're a Levitical Kohen or whether you are part of this royal priesthood, this royal Kohanim, when you put on the garments, you're putting on the glory that Yeshua had from the beginning because he established these commandments for us to walk in from the beginning. He, he divided the light from the beginning so that we could walk in it. And that's still what the garments are for. The garments are for glory. And so responding to a holy calling is responding to a call to begin putting on garments of glory in preparation 
for that future work in the garden when we are restored and that role of priest is restored in the garden. That's your calling. You were training for a job that maybe you didn't know you were going to have. But it is work. It is service. And it's a guarding. It's, it's, you have to know where the boundaries are. If you want to do the work, you have to know where the boundaries are. And if you're going to respect the boundaries, then you need to do the work. You need to do the service. And 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says, it was for this he called you. G2564, he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So your calling as a royal priesthood, a priesthood and training for the garden is so that you can gain the glory that Adam and Eve lost. Because remember the, the tradition says that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their garments of glory and therefore they were left with animal skins. They didn't have that brightness of face like Moshe had in the tent of meeting. And so now we, we settle with just basically animal skins covering us. But when we go back into the garden, when we encounter that glorious light of his word, and we know the glorious light of that word is Yeshua. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Um, and, and then it goes on and it gives this long treatise on light and how the world didn't want the light. They preferred the darkness. And so if you go back and read the gospel of John chapter one and beyond, you get what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. Yes, you were called through the gospel, but it doesn't stop at salvation. Once you were saved, then you start learning your calling in order to do it and to maintain the boundaries of holiness in an unholy world and in a dark world so that when the time comes, you will realize that what you have put on through your obedience is you have actually gained the glory of Yeshua of the word that was from the beginning, of the, of the glory that was in the garden. So I know we have to stop there because of time. Um, but in tomorrow's class, we're going to look at some things that are a matter of perspective. Um, how sometimes we can look at things. I, I don't know if any of you, when you were younger, you didn't really get that there were two kinds of priesthood that were equally valid. And it seemed like the Levitical priesthood was like the glory job, you know, woo until you get to the gospels, then maybe not so much. <laughs> but um, You also have to remember that the priesthood and the gospels had been corrupted. So it's it not nearly the ideal it should have been, but we, we tend to focus on the Aaronic priesthood. And it's like the, the kingdom of priests is a consolation prize. It's not that way. They're both equally important. The, the Aaronic priesthood is going to minister to Israel, but Israel's job is much more difficult because they have to take that same degree of holiness. They have to know the same boundaries of holiness as a Levitical priest and then take it out into the nations and translate that to the nations in language and actions that they can understand in a confused world, a very confused world. And I'm not saying Israel's not confused. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. But when you get out into the world, then you can appreciate how unconfused Israel is compared to the world. So I would just exhort you, embrace your priesthood and training. You have a vocation. You're called, and it's not a consolation prize. 
It's every bit as important. Your job is every bit as documented in this book of Vayikra as a Levitical priest. Because there are certain holies that are for everyone. There are certain holies you will practice in your home that you need to maintain that boundary in the world. No matter how the world may behave sexually, there is a boundary in your house and you maintain that boundary and you're not going to confuse the issue. That's the whole message right now. Let's confuse the issue even of gender. Right? But you know what the boundary is. You have to maintain it. You can't force the world to maintain it, but you can maintain it as a testimony. And when you do, just like the scripture says, you will suffer for it. which is kind of a down note, but the up note of maintaining those boundaries is you may not realize it, but you're putting on glory every time you hold that line. You're going from glory to glory to glory to glory. <laughs>